60 Minuten lang für euch einen schönen Vortrag halten. Sie kommt aus Südafrika, extra hierher. Ihr Name ist Dr. Carolina Oedman Gov. Govenda, ich habe es vorhin äh, geübt, ich habe es natürlich wieder falsch gemacht. Und die Frau hat so dermaßen viele äh, Titel und Jobs schon äh, beglichen, dass mein Ehrgeiz, die alle aufzuzählen, an dieser Stelle versiegt. Ähm, herzlich willkommen. Good morning, everyone. And uh, first, I absolutely need to thank Republica for inviting me. This, this meeting is absolutely phenomenal. And I absolutely need also to thank my doctor, Dr. Woody, who made it possible for me to be here this week. Last week was a bit crazy, so I really needed to shout out to her. Okay, welcome home. This is, this is our home, this is planet Earth. This is where we live. And I'd like to share a few amazing facts about this little planet on which we live. On this scale, um, the atmosphere is about the thickness of a few sheets of paper. And that means we have a shell here that barely registers. It's a tiny, tiny shell of air. If you take about 10 kilometers of depth of oceans, 100 kilometers of atmosphere, there's a tiny shell here on the surface of this planet where all the life we know, we have known, and likelihood um, future life that we can envisage today happens. You, me, our neighbors, our friends and families, um, the dinosaurs, all the insects, the political figures, you know, the Che Guevara's, the Nelson Mandela's, everybody and every life form shares this one very thin shell of atmosphere where life happens. And, uh, and, and this is phenomenal. This is, this is our home. And, it, and it's not very big. Let's compare it to the sun, where we get all our energy, because life also needs this energy to live. This is about as big as the Earth is compared to the sun. Okay, the distance isn't quite right on this image, but the size is. This planet is, you can fit it a million times inside the sun. This is the tiny rock on which all these things are happening, all the technology that we see, all the, all the ideas that people have, every individual, their mental universe, everything that happens in their head happens on this little piece of rock that goes around the sun. Now, what about the sun? The sun is one of a few hundred billion stars that live, uh, that stay in, in, in our Milky Way galaxy. So if this is, this is not the Milky Way because we can't get out of it and take a picture of it, but it's about as close as it gets, right? And the sun, say, is about two thirds out from the center. And it's a tiny, tiny little star. And around this tiny star is this even smaller little rock of a planet where we live. It's minuscule, it's completely insignificant. But it's also completely extraordinary because on this piece of rock, lives a species, the human race, that has the capacity to understand how small and how big these things are. We have a species here that's capable of inventing technology to leave the planet and come back with people on board, to send people orbiting around the planet. It's, it's a species that is capable of you know, creating incredible solutions to problems they face in everyday life. For about the, say, last hundred years or so, this, this little species has been extremely loud in terms of space. For about hundred years, we have been broadcasting radio signals, television signals, and so on. And that is our footprint in space. Because from the moment that we start broadcasting, our signals also go straight out into space. And they travel, obviously, at the speed of light. And so if we have been broadcasting for about 100 years, that's about 100 light years around the Earth. That's the bubble in which, if somebody has an antenna and listens in, can say, ah, there's a species on that planet, and they're saying things. We're talking. We're spreading ideas and, and images and everything. We're loud. Now, how big is this 
footprint that we have on the scale of the galaxy. Let me just go here. Okay. It's smaller than my thumbnail. Because for those hundred light years in both directions, you know, this big bubble of signals is about a thousandth of the size of this galaxy. The galaxy, our Milky Way, is about a hundred thousand light years across. It is enormous. And that's where we are, and that's why we're screaming our ideas to the rest of the universe. What about, let's take a little tour. We're starting from Earth, and we're traveling towards the constellation of Orion. You see, you can recognize the three stars. Um, but the constellation of Orion sort of decomposes here. And there's a reason for that, is that even though it makes a beautiful picture in the sky when we look at it, these stars have actually nothing in common. Some are close, some are very, very far away. They go from a few hundred light years away to a few thousand light years away, just within the constellation of Orion, which means that the light from those stars come to us, and what we see today is the way the star was th so many thousands of years ago. So today, when you look at the sky at night, not only does everything you see belong to our own galaxy, but you're not seeing an, a picture of the universe the way it is. No, you see that star the way it was a, in a certain time ago, and you see that star the way it was way, 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 way back, you know, thousands of years ago. And that star may not exist anymore, but we don't know yet, because it takes light so long to travel and reach us. So as we travel through the Milky Way and you see these nebula, you know, the, the remains of exploding stars that eject all their gas into space, and it's so much energy, and there's so much light there that it makes them glow. That's why we can see them in, the, in our telescopes and measure them, and it's so beautiful. And this, if this is our galaxy, it's just one of billions of galaxies in the universe. So already we're pretty small, you know, that little rock around the star in this galaxy. But let's look. We have our neighboring galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Um, and we have, we have, well, thousands more. I don't know if you can see very well, but this, these galaxies form a very intricate and beautiful three-dimensional structure in space. In fact, nothing in space is static and nothing in space is flat. Everything is constantly in motion, in evolution. Here we're passing uh, Andromeda. And now everything you see here is just galaxies. You know, and you see this three-dimensional structure. And this is all based on real measurements, this, this film. That's why I like it so much, because it really is based on, on our measured positions of these things. Now, it's quite incredible that we managed to figure out where they are, right? Because the only thing we have to to figure these things out is just the light coming from objects in space. It's just those photons that just happen to be on a collision course with planet Earth and with our telescopes. That's the only thing we have to work out, this incredible large structure that we can see here. And uh, gravity being the force that works on those scales, you know, things are orbit around each other. It's not just the Earth around the sun and the sun around the center of the galaxy. It's galaxies around each other as well, and they cluster, and they make these enormous clusters of galaxies, and they collide, and they eat each other. And this is, um, this is the center of one of the biggest clusters of galaxies in the universe. And so this is a little journey. Now we're so far away that there's absolutely no way to figure out how to, to be able to comprehend how big this is. Now what happens if you point a telescope to a dark patch of the sky, where you think there's nothing at all, and you just let it sit there. This was done with the Hubble Space Telescope the first time, and this is one of those images. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So what happens is you p point this telescope in a dark patch. You think there's nothing there. You haven't ever measured anything in that piece of sky with any telescope yet, and you just sit and wait. And little by little, photons will come in from really, really far away, and when you, once you're patient enough and you wait for all those photons to come and hit your detectors, this is what you get. This image is phenomenal. Every little dot on this picture, except the one with the plus here, is a galaxy. Every single one of them is hundreds of billions of stars. 
Every single one of these galaxies is evolving, is merging, is, is, is traveling out in space. Wherever we look, if we wait long enough, we see these objects. The universe is bigger than we can possibly imagine. And the most extraordinary thing is that we are the ones who actually built the telescopes, put it in space, looked at those, got these images, and know what they mean. And, and I think that's one of the biggest gifts that astronomy gives us, is the gift of perspective. Um, so, telescopes. Let's look at telescopes a little bit. There's some really, really cool technology that goes into telescopes. I'm just going to talk, talk uh, about telescopes on the ground. These are the 10-meter class telescopes that we call in, uh, optical telescopes. That means that their, their mirrors are of the order of 10 meters. The, the biggest ones are listed here. The one on the picture is the Southern African Large Telescope in South Africa. Um, let's look just at maybe the VLT, the Gemini, and the Large Binocular Telescope. These telescopes are made with one mirror. Just imagine this, one mirror, eight meters across. Um, imagine how thick it must be. Imagine how difficult it must be to polish it to, you know, to nanometers precision and have a fantastic reflective surface. Imagine how heavy it must be to turn around to follow the stars at night, because obviously the sky moves at night, right? Those are some of the incredible technological challenges that we face when we build new telescopes. So I'm just going to check this out. Yeah. So an additional point with these mirrors is that for the light to hit the mirror and, be, and converge towards one point where we can measure it, you know, a detector, a camera, an instrument, a spectrograph, something, the mirror has to be parabolic. That means it's not a simple spherical shape, which means that if you, if you look at the other mirrors that are, it doesn't say single, these are segmented mirrors. So you build, you know, like uh, segments of mirror and then you put them together and you align them with very high precision. But if you have a parabolic mirror, these segments cannot all be the same. You know, the curvature, the shape of the mirror has to be different. Every single mirror has to be different. That's, that's really, you know, it's, it's not easy to build. And also, on these telescopes, we don't have eyes pieces anymore. We don't look through the telescope anymore. We just put instruments. But also, all the light that we collect has to be shared across the instruments. So, so if we look at very faint objects, you know, we have to prioritize. We have to choose which instrument we will channel with what light to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, whether we want to look at the spectrum of the light, whether we want to just make some imagery. If it, it all depends what we're looking for. But there's, there's also, astronomy is a fantastic driver of technological innovation. And one example I want to talk to you about is adaptive optics. And this is great. So you have this great telescope, right? It has a phenomenal mirror. You can really look at small, small details. Except it's looking through the atmosphere, right? And I don't know if you've, if you've looked above the fire in a barbecue or something. You see the air is making all these patterns. It's exactly the same in the atmosphere, but we can't really see it. But when you look, to it, when you look at a telescope, the telescope can see it. So what we should see as points in the sky, the stars, actually become blurry and they, they move all the time. So imagine this, you point a laser next to a star that you're observing, and you look at the point of the laser beam. And this laser beam is being deformed by, this, by the, the, the wobbliness of the air in the atmosphere. And by looking at that, you can correct the astronomical image in real time. Because you can see, you know, you can see what, what the atmosphere is doing to the point, the laser point you know is a point. Use that as a reference, and then you, you invert that effect, and you get your point image. You increase the resolution of telescopes like that tremendously. And that's a sort of really cool technological innovation that comes, that comes with astronomy. But technological innovation isn't just about making new inventions and, uh, and, uh, and, ha and, and throwing a lot m of money into new technology. It's not that. It's also about finding really clever ways of doing things with the same or even less money. And one good example is this telescope, the Southern African Large Telescope. This mirror, it's a 91 segmented mirror, 91 piece. And uh, instead of being parabolic, it's spherical, right? So the problem with that is that the light isn't focused into one point. It's focused into a whole blob. But then there's some really, really clever engineering and software engineering that goes into that to correct for that. And the great advantage is that each mirror segment can then be identical. So these 91 mirrors 
they're all the same. They're all spherical. They all have the same curvature. They can be swapped. They can be, they can, they're cheaper to build, etc. So something like this, plus a few other technological innovations in this telescope, make it five times cheaper than an equivalent telescope with a parabolic mirror and, and all the other gimmicks. So, so by being really clever on how we do things, um, we also invent new new technology and new ways of doing things. By the way, did you know that um, Wi-Fi is a spin-off of uh, radio astronomy? But let's look a bit at the future. Optical telescopes. There's, there's a lot of future optical telescopes that are being built, notably the European Extremely Large Telescope. But I want to mention this one specifically, the LSST, because this telescope tries to do everything at once. It's got a massive mirror, one piece, really, really hard work. You can see the structure is rather heavy. But it has a 3 billion pixel digital camera to be able to do imaging in color, looking deep into space, and, uh, and, and, and looking fast. Because you can either look for a long time to collect more light, or you can have a really, really big aperture, or you can, you can, you know, you have all these trade-offs. And this telescope tries to do everything at once. But obviously, with three billion pixel camera, you generate quite a bit of data. I don't know how many of you have run out of disk space just because of the size of the CCDs nowadays, right? 20 terabytes of data per night. Um, now we're talking big data. Now this is becoming interesting. Let's look at radio astronomy. I'm just going to mention two telescopes here. One is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array that was inaugurated just a couple of weeks ago in Chile. It's 66 dishes, because when we observe the universe in radio, we use dishes, not mirrors. Same thing, but um, works slightly differently. The data rates you know, that are generated by something like this, imagine 66 devices measuring constantly and sending data through. That data has to go from the middle of nowhere in a desert in Chile, on the top of a mountain, down to Santiago, the capital of Chile, and then out to wherever the scientists are. There's a big link to the US, for example. Do we have all that bandwidth? Well, currently, it is absolutely a challenge. So how do we deal with it? The second radio telescope I want to tell you about is the SKA, Square Kilometer Array. And I just have a few facts here for you. Um, okay, this is going to be built in, uh, in Africa and in Australia, mostly in Africa. This is where the, the dishes are going to be spaced. So it's very interesting, it's not just on one side. Every little white dot there shows a place where you will have a piece of the telescope. So this is basically spreading over 3,000 kilometers, turning the planet into a giant radio eye that's going to look in deep into the universe. A few facts. And I must stress here that the technology for this doesn't yet exist, right? So 3,000 antenna, um, the, just if you add up the surface of the dishes, you end up with a million square meters. It's a pretty big light collecting area. On top of that, there are two types of antennae that go with it, a low and mid-frequency aperture arrays, as we, as we call them. The low frequency aperture array is going to be built in Australia, and the rest is going to be built in Africa. Now, in terms of data, one day of observation, so the advantage with radio astronomy is that we can observe during the day as well, not just at night. One day of observation is equivalent to about two million years of music in MP3 format. Just one day of observation, two million years of music. 15 million 64 gigabyte iPods, just to put it to scale with something we're familiar with, right? The dishes themselves, they will be spread all over the continent, they will collect that data, and they will transport it. And just the traffic, the data traffic, is going, to be in, is going to be more than 10 times the global internet traffic today. So we're basically building a scientific instrument that will generate more data traffic than the whole internet today. That's why I'm saying we don't really have the technology yet. But it's going to happen, because that's what we do in astronomy. In terms of computing power, um, we're talking about exaflops here, 10 to the 18 operations per second. It's, it's, it's enormous. I mean, the, the, the just the scale of this instrument. Some analysts actually looked at um, the London Olympics, and they estimated it to be the biggest data-generating event so far, with about 60 gigabytes per second in images, tweets, and emails, and Facebook posts, and updates, and whatever, whatever. 60 gigabytes per second, that's what the network had to carry. 
Well, that's just about half of one of the low-frequency array stations of the SKA, right? So we're really going to incredible scales here. Um, so on top of generating all this data, way more than we can actually handle today, we also have a lot of archives, right? The big, all the big observatories have archives with data. But if you look around, um, you know, it's not like we're very much in a, you know, Web 2.0 kind of area. This is very academic. We have these archives. You can download a tarball of gigabytes if you want. You know, it's, it's not like you can, you know, call an observatory with a nice API, get your data back in JSON, pipe it in your JavaScript thing, and have your visualization write that. We're not quite there yet. But we'd love to. So, so, so what are we doing about it? Um, you know, many astronomers are actually really, really geeky. And so we have this community of uh, people we get, get together regularly for a series of workshops. We call it dot astronomy. That's basically where astronomy and the internet meet. The idea here is that this is a bunch of geeks, a bunch of astronomers who would like to have the coolness of the internet and, the, and, and all those great technologies that are you know, really useful for everything else, and see how can, we, how can we use it in astronomy, right? So we have, we have keynote speakers at those meetings, and usually it's people outside astronomy, you know, data visualization specialists or, or uh, you know, web development specialists or whatever. We also have unconference sessions just to get the conversations going because that's where you get the ideas and you want to talk about them when everybody's there. And we always have hack days, right? And the astronomy hack days have been so popular that they have now satellited off the series of workshop, and you have independently organized dot astronomy hack days around the world. And, and this is where the coolness hits, right? Let me just show you a few examples. Um, first, um, this is where we have some audio. I hope this works. This is one hack that comes from an afternoon and a bit of an evening of hacking, right? This is an image of the sky. And they have turned it. Let's see if this works. Can we hear? Yeah. So I'm moving the cursor here. Maybe I can make it a little bit louder. And what they've done is they have turned the image into sound. They, can, they have looked at different frequencies of light and given them different tones, the high pitch, the low pitch. And, uh, and, and then the, the intensity of the sound matches the intensity of that frequency of light in that spot of the image. So this was really a fun hack to do, but it turns out that it's an actually a great tool to illustrate the different densities of images that we get to, for example, uh, visually impaired people. You know? And this is just a hack. This is just an afternoon. Uh, something else. Oh, yeah, now this is great. I love this one. This, this is a little JavaScript that was written by one of our dot astronomy geeks. It's a, it's a Gaussian fitting routine. All astronomers use Gaussian fitting routines. We fit everything with Gaussians. In this case, um, this is an illustration where, for example, you look at the light curve of a star. So you look at a star, it's bright, it's bright, it's bright, it's bright, and suddenly there's a dip in the brightness, and then it goes back to normal. That might be the sign of a planet passing in front of a star. This is one of the techniques that we use to find planets outside our solar system, right? But you have these observations, and they come, and they're quite noisy. You see error bars and everything. So let's generate one of these data sets. Um, and you can see that you want to fit this, because you want to figure out you know, the likelihood of actually um, finding a planet. And just the Gaussian fit routine, JavaScript, it's fast enough nowadays. You can just do it very quickly, just like that. And this is a really cool little JavaScript. So imagine this. Imagine being a researcher in astronomy. And what you're doing, you're just calling an API to, a, to an observatory or an archive or a telescope, something, you're getting some data, you pipe it into this. You know, it's, the workflow is so much faster, easier to visualize, but also easier to share with collaborators and so on and so on. This is where we want to get to. You know, this is where we want to go. Um, another, so, Oh, this is great. Another little hack was the cosmology calculator widget. This is it. So this guy, uh, Ned Wright, um, a while ago, wrote this little script where you can put in certain values for certain fundamental parameters of the universe, and it will calculate the rest. You know, and it's it's a fairly complex calculation. So it's everybody uses the thing. You know, it'll tell you how much how much dark matter, dark energy, ordinary matter, age of the universe, and all these things. 
And well, one of the hacks was to say, well, instead of having to go to NetWrite's website all the time and enter those data, let's just, just, just make a little widget for us. It makes life easier. And it is so cool. I mean, I have a widget on my computer that calculates the parameters of the universe for me like that. Now, that's cool stuff. That's where we want to go. And so this is typically the sort, of, the sort of hacks we come up with. But the thing is, at these meetings, you know, it's not just astronomers who do this. We, we're just, you know, geeky astronomers, but then we have to go back to our, to our jobs and, and do the things we do the more traditional way. But as soon as we get a chance, you know, we do this because we can and because it's fun, right? But also because we know people who are not astronomers, you know, who are hackers, who are developers, etc., and who are interested in astronomy. And it makes for a phenomenal uh, interface, and we have so much fun together. So. I'm saying all the hackers in the room, if you want to do some astronomy, just, you know, get in touch. And there's a million projects we can do. And if you want, if you feel up to creating an API for us to call our archives, go for it. Um, so we really need more hackers. Um, right. Right. So basically, we have a challenge. Everything is data. You go on Flickr, you take a picture, you see a picture of somebody, you know, having a holiday, right? Tourist, happy, so. What's the data here? You have weather data, you have cultural data by looking at the person, you have geographical data, you have, you have you know, the whole spectrum of, of, uh, of, of light of the picture. Everything is data. There's so much data out there that doesn't even know it's data yet because we haven't just yet found the ways of, of, uh, of, of tackling it and getting the knowledge out of it. And so let's look at astronomy. Data is, is our food, right? Long time ago, um, the data was taken manually or with photographic plates, and it had to be processed and turned into numbers so that it could be compared. And, well, usually, well, this is, this is Harvard about 120-odd years ago. You'd have one senior astronomer, and he would have all these women who would do the, all the hard work, but he would be the astronomer. He would take the observations, and then the women, they actually were called to the computers. Um, since then, we've made a bit of progress. There's actual computers that help work on the data. And that means as soon as we started have to have computers at home, and as soon as we started being connected at home, astronomers thought, OK, great, let's use this. SETI at home. Um, it was huge in the 90s. Are you guys still taking part? It was this phenomenal screensaver where you could get data from the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico and analyze it to see if there were signals from extraterrestrial intelligence. And I want to highlight something here. SETI is a serious quest. It is absolutely serious. Because it's deep down in our human nature to always be on a quest, to search. You know, and searching for life in the universe makes total sense. There's no reason why we should be the only ones, right? But as I said, our footprint is very small. So if we find life, you know, somewhere in the universe, they must have been around for a long, long time for us to be able to see them. But let's not despair. Let's keep looking, because that's what we do. Now, SETI at Home was a great citizen science project. It still is, and it still works. But it's a citizen science project that uses your computer's idle time. But there's something more, that an, an incredible resource that we haven't quite talked about yet here. That's the human mind. And that's where citizen science really blooms into, into a, a real force for scientific research. Machines, they just run out, run out of cleverness after a while, right? Um, you know, they, you tell them what to do, they do it brilliantly. But when it comes to looking around and figuring out what's, what's out of the ordinary, not so much. The human eye, however, is great at that. So I'm just going to talk about this one citizen science project here that really started this train of, instead of using CPU power, we use brain power and human brain power. And, uh, and the Galaxy Zoo is this great web platform where you can go and you can go classify galaxies. Because this comes, this comes from a survey called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They have pictures of millions of galaxies. And try to tell a computer to be able to make the difference between that image and that image. That this is a spiral, that it has two arms, and that this is a you know, blob, so a, you know, an elliptical galaxy. <laughs> it's, in, it's really, really hard to create an algorithm that can see that. Well, to us it's obvious, right? So why not ask humans to do it? And those pictures are beautiful, so people do. 
Um, and it's been, it's been phenomenal. It really has helped research in terms of, you know, galaxy morphology and evolution, etc., etc. But there's something even more powerful here. And that's the little question in the bottom right. Is there anything odd? This is where we ask people to, f to point out, hang on, I don't understand this in this image. And this has led some, to some phenomenal discoveries. The first one is this, right? This blue thing here was this image landed on the PC of this uh, school teacher in, in Holland, Hanif van Arkel. And, uh, and she loves astronomy. And she spends hours on galaxies, classifying galaxies, and she's completely passionate about it. And she comes to this image and is like, what's this blue blob, right? And so she goes to the forum and she talks to other people. And on the forum, you have a, a professional astronomers as well. And they're like, hang on. We would have missed this. What is this thing? And it turns out it was absolutely unknown what it was, to the point where even the Hubble Space Telescope was pointed to this object to try to see it. And here we see much more detail. We see the green glow. It actually turns out to be the tail of a, of, um, of a tidal interaction where, where galaxies have you know, interacted and they pull material off each other, and you have this tail, it's like t the tide, you know, the force of tide, gravity pulling stuff off, and it used to be lit up by a quasar that isn't there anymore, but we can still see the green light that comes from oxygen, and it's such a violent area, actually, that there's a little orange blob there in the top, you can almost see it. There's star formation happening there, which means that there's, there's so much... Um, there's no, so much pressure that the gas is actually moving and it's, and it's collapsing and it's forming new stars. And this is, this is quite an odd thing to have found. Um, and it would not have happened were it not for this amazing school teacher just pointing it out somewhere because the human mind sees these things, sees the context of things. Another example are these, the little green peas, as we call them, you know, the little green blobs, and they started to be picked up by quite a few people, and so um, that led to follow-up investigation, and this is, this is one of the scientific papers that came out of it. It's actually, it was actually a whole new class of galaxies that we didn't even know about, because we hadn't, we hadn't seen them, we just hadn't, or we hadn't figured it out, you know, if you see one galaxy and you see a little green thing, you can imagine maybe it's noise and the data or something like that. No, no, this is actually a real thing. And originally they wanted to submit the paper with the full 200,000 people who had contributed to this discovery. And they wanted to submit the paper with 200, over 200,000 authors. Obviously the journal wasn't too happy about that. But these are the names. 200,000 people contributed to this discovery of a new type of galaxy. And, and I think that's just phenomenal. It's just, it's great that we can, I mean, we, we would not be where we are were it not for the contribution of citizens. So there's lots of these projects. Um, it's actually blossomed into, into a big platform now. We call it the Zooniverse. And you have lots of different astronomy projects, but it's now also climate projects and nature and even social sciences and things. You can go and check out the Zooniverse. There are lots of citizen science projects, and they're all beautiful. They're all really, really beautiful. Each of them has this fantastic interface, and it's interesting, and you learn stuff, and it's beautiful images, and it's, it's just so much fun. Um, then there's another way we can, we can share astronomy with the people, and this is robotic telescopes. I'm only going to mention two projects. There's, there's diff lots of them, but I'm just going to mention this one, the Las Cumbres Observatory Global Telescope Network. These guys have put telescopes all around the globe in a way that means that at any time you have a working telescope it, that's at night, both in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. Which means that at any time around the world, scientists or classrooms or, you know, people can log on to these telescopes and make observations. You know, you don't have to have a telescope in your backyard, you can actually use these robotic telescopes. Another network um, I want to talk about quickly is the Gloria project. This is an EU project. This is interesting because it's taking existing telescopes and modifying them so that they can join a network of robotic telescopes. And they're interesting because, you know, they're sort of setting standards. Imagine one day if we have um, RTCP. RTCP would be Radio Telescope Command Protocol. Okay, we don't have that yet. But imagine if we had that, you know? That would be so cool. We could just log in, send a few commands, it would be a standard. Any telescope could be turned into a robotic telescope. If you have a telescope at home, you want to use it for yourself, you just do it. And the rest of the time, you plug it into the network, Internet of Things, telescopes, there you go. 
That would be phenomenal. So we're getting there. But what's next? Okay. Today, um, we have well, we talk, talk and talked about software and you know citizen science online and all these things. But there are so many great hardware tools nowadays. You know, we have the, we have the Raspberry Pi, we have the Arduino boards. This is a DigiSpark. This is a little Arduino compatible board. We talk about multi-sensor arrays, intelligent cities. Just imagine if the multi-sensor part of your multi-sensor array was astronomical in nature. You know, we use sensors in astronomy to measure the, all that light and the radio signals and all that. Just imagine the possibilities of democratizing this incredible science using this kind of component. It's becoming, it's becoming possible. And I can't say any more. There's stuff coming, it's, it's coming soon, and the only thing I can say is stay tuned, because there's some really, really cool stuff coming soon. And I'm afraid I can't do anything more but hint at something, but yeah, very exciting. Okay, so the theme of this meeting is inside out, right? The crowd today, the connected crowd around the world is, I think about two billion people are connected to the internet. We're more than seven billion on this earth. So the real crowd is not those two billion that are connected. The real crowd is actually those five and something billion of the rest of the world. So let me turn the question inside out. Instead of saying what, instead of asking what people can do for astronomy, let me ask what astronomy can do for the people. And I want to tell you a little story about this little town called Sutherland in the Northern Cape province of South Africa. It's a small town, about 4,000 people in, uh, in the semi-arid desert. The nearest town is about 100 kilometers away. There's actually a tarred road leading to Sutherland, but a couple of other towns, it's just gravel road, you know, in the desert, in and out, you know, trace, 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 gravel road. It's very isolated. Sutherland is not just isolated from the rest of the world, it's even isolated from the rest of South Africa. Um, but Sutherland is beautiful. This is the night sky of Sutherland. It's, it's, the, it's this sort of place on Earth where you go and you look up and you see the stars and you look to one side and you see the stars and you see the stars and you look all the way down to the horizon and you see the stars. Everywhere you look, only stars. It's so beautiful, and the stars are so everywhere that you feel like you're halfway there, that you're floating in space. It is beautiful. And obviously, that's where we'll put telescopes, right? Now the question is, what does having a world-class scientific facility mean for a town like Sutherland? So let me tell you a little bit more about, about the town of Sutherland. The town of Sutherland is about 4,000 people, I said. But it's so isolated, you know, there's not like, it's not like there's a lot of jobs going or anything. 4,000 people, there's about 80% unemployment. Um, it's one of the highest alcohol abuse rates in the country, one of the highest fetal alcohol syndrome in the country. That means that babies are born alcoholic because their mothers drink during pregnancy. It's got very, very profound social problems and it's got very little attention from the rest of the world, from the government, because it's a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. But it has these telescopes. And so what happens? Well, first, the, the, the Southern African Large Telescope was inaugurated in 2005. And Sutherland is famous for its skies. So it drives tourism, right? So that's good, you know, tourists come, and they experience the night sky, they have these deep, profound conversations about it, and they leave, and it's great. And that kind of helps because, you know, it drives tourism. So, so the town of Southern has gone from less than five to over 50 guest houses uh, between before and after SALT, the Southern African Large Telescope. And that obviously creates a lot of jobs. Um, so that's, that's all very positive, right? But we can do more, obviously. So the, the, the observatory, the astronomers, um, can engage the community. And, and, and the story I'm telling you is, is an adventure that started on New Year's Eve in 2008, the night before the beginning of the International Year of Astronomy, where the whole plateau with all the scientific instruments was open to the public. You shut down the scientific observations, and, and you know, to, if you tell that to astronomers, they're going to go, 
what? You can't do that because telescopes are so expensive. They work 24-7 all the time. Well, no, this night was the night for the public. Amateur astronomers could come and they could put their own telescopes. Et it, was, it was a massive event. And it really put Sutherland on the map if it wasn't already. And so people came and visited the telescopes. They had conversations, etc. So it's beautiful. But that's one event. Now we're talking the community. So how do we engage the community? We engage with the school kids, obviously. You know, you give them tours, you give them stargazing sessions. The, heart, the, pro the point of this is not to teach them about, you know, the math and science. Obviously, that will be an outcome. But the point here is to connect them with the sky. Because the reason people come from all around the world to see the sky there is because it's so special. And this is their backyard. This is their home. This is a source of pride for these kids and for the community. And so we engage the community. We engage with the social workers, the, the community development workers, etc., etc., and try to bring every th everybody on board to make use of the fact that we have astronomy there to drive the development of society itself. So these are a couple of kids in Sutherland. This is the sort of houses they live in. It's the coldest place in South Africa. It's a place that has seen snow every month of the year. doesn't mean it snows every month, but there has been snow there every month of the year, as far as rec records go. It's very cold. And it's not like they have, you know, insulation in the houses and warm clothes or anything. It's a very, very harsh life. So we got together with some artist friends of ours and, and tried to to engage the community and see how this perspective that, and the skills that we gain from being educated people can help uh, with the community, right? So the first idea was to get the kids to look up. Mm, and how do you do that? Well, you organize a kite festival. So you started flying kites. You know, you fly a couple of kites. Within five minutes, you have 150 kids coming, running barefoot from all around the town, who, and we play with them for hours. And, uh, and this is a very, very powerful experiment because not only is it about looking up, but it's also you notice that things are moving. The clouds are moving, the stars are moving. You connect it with what they see at night as well. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this movie, but you can see here the stars are, 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 are moving over, you know, at night. This is the Southern Cross. It's rotating around the South Pole, South Celestial Pole. This is something... It's about taking ownership of the sky. It's about being proud. We have this beautiful sky. So we're not going to turn our spotlights upwards and, and, and forget about it. People come from all around the world to see our sky. You know, it's, it's, it's a source of pride. And it's also something that guides their life because the stars are there everywhere. It's, there are so many stars, it's impossible not to have the stars play a role in your life when you live there. Second thing is, okay, we're flying kites. Let's take a look at what Sutherland looks like from the kite's perspective. You know, this is again, we're changing perspective. And this is pictures of the kids who are imagining a map of Sutherland. They create a map of Sutherland, not by measuring, but just by imagining themselves being the kite and looking down. Uh, with all sorts of materials you find in the town, etc., etc., the perspective we gain is, is, is very precious. You realize, you know, how far or close you are to your neighbors, etc., etc. The next thing we do is um, we make constellations, right? Constellations are man-made. Constellations don't really have any physical connection, you know. So, and constellations have stories going with them. And these stories are an embodiment of culture and knowledge in the sense that you will have a legend that says, you know, this constellation appears at this time of year and that, that means that that's the time of year to go and harvest, for example. All that sort of stuff is, is, is knowledge that is embedded in astronomical legends and things. But kids have imagination and let's, you know, make them make their own constellation. So you take these tubes, you make little holes, you can look through it during the day and it looks like a constellation. It's a lot of fun to create, it's very creative. It's got to do with the stars, and they create their own telescopes, if you will, and beautiful objects that they can be proud of. Um, we also take, you know, having, these, um, having this project, we have, we have brought in incredible brains to Sutherland. And they come for a week or for a workshop, art science workshop, and all that. And so we sit down, and there's nothing to do in Sutherland. Trust me, there's nothing to do but to look at the scar stars. And it's an incredibly inspiring place to be, to think about the community, and the stars are so inspiring, you get great ideas, etc. Et so it's, it's, 
beautiful experience to come there and to, to get these brains, these people who come from Johannesburg, from all different cities and who are used to solving problems in those contexts and bring them to Sutherland and see what they can do. And uh, in this case, that's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ar architect slash artist here who, who was helping us figure out a plan to try to revive this park, this area, for the, so, so that it would be safe for the kids to play in some because there's barbed wires, broken glass, etc., etc. And he realized that we hadn't thought of that, in fact, shade, the shadow, is a, is a rare thing in the desert. It gets very hot during the day, the sun is baking, and you don't really have shade to, to play. So, so if we build a place where we can have shade, that will bring the community together. And, and, and it's ideas like that that will come from bringing people to Sutherland. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, that it'll happen tomorrow, but the idea is there. And when it happens, it'll happen with these great ideas. And so we also engage the old people in the community because they have all the stories. They tell us about, you know, even pre-apartheid times, how they were forcibly removed, how the land was taken from them. And to celebrate that, we bring them up to the plateau and celebrate with this symbolic dome that has now become a community dome with, with, uh, with, a, with a silhouette of a, of a member of the community that takes pride in the land and in the night sky that we share with the community, as us as, as, as astronomers have to share with the community. And so we also represent them in the, in the visitor center of the, of the observatory. That has a lot of science exhibits and so on and so on, but you also have this beautiful Milky Way uh, installation where it tells the story of one of the old people in town, Orm Thomas, who's 106 years old, I think, this year. And he tells the story that his grandparents told him that when he was a kid, that if you see a shooting star fall down, you have to run and find it and throw it back into the sky. And it's an absolutely beautiful story. And, and this, this galaxy, this installation here, is made with uh, hundreds of pieces of crockery, porcelain, that is broken, that was found in the old place where they used to live before apartheid moved them. Nothing has happened there since. And still now, if you walk around, you find all these the old objects. And they're like, oh, I remember. This was my coffee cup when I was a kid. You know? And that's, that's still there. And so we celebrate the history like that. And, uh, and of course, education, education, education. There's nothing like a kid you know, showing what upside down is like on the other side of the planet, you know, what hemisphere we're on and so on. It's phenomenal. And it's, it really is about making the kids realize that they can do it. it, is, it they have the potential to understand everything. And, and astronomy is really there to inspire them. Um, when you have it, uh, an observatory, you obviously have great internet connection because all that data has to go to the, to the central part of the observatory. Um, on the picture on the left is the, um, the optic fiber that's being installed between Cape Town and the site of the SKA in Sutherland. Um, and and, and that's, you know, that's, the, that's the pipe that's going to take the data from the telescopes down to Cape Town and then to the rest of the world. So the observatory in Sutherland decides to share its internet connection with, with the community. So there's this community center with 24 computers and internet access. And th the difference this makes is enormous because in people in this community are not, not just not familiar with computers, but the internet is just, you know, it's, it's uh, I think you have a 3G connection there since just a few years back, right? And so this is a massive difference. But what are we going to do with it? You know, we're organizing Skype sessions with kids elsewhere in the country and around the world to de-isolate the kids and realize that you know, kids elsewhere have the same interests and so on. But we also want to give them those skills that we have gained as astronomers. And what skills am I talking about? Well, there's problem solving, you know, there's change of perspective, but there's also programming. You know, we're as astronomers, we're, you know, we code. We're not, we don't code beautifully, mostly, um, because we're not coders, but, but we code, right? And it's an incredible skill to have. It's super useful. So instead of trying to make the next generation of office workers and teach them you know, word processing and spreadsheets, we're going to teach them programming. This is, this is a workshop where the kids were learning Scratch, and they had so much fun you know, creating their animations and putting them up online and so on and so on. And so the work with the community keeps going, and we're really using the, the observatory as a, as a resource. But I think the bottom line is this. 
Let's come back to, let's come back home. When you look at this planet, when you look at this continent, when you look, when you look at this, the real Earth the way it is, if you try to point your finger between two regions and understand what people are fighting about, it doesn't really make sense from up here, does it? You know, you can't tell the difference between this spot and that spot of land, and maybe thousands of people are being killed over it. Um, if you see the Earth like this, uh, from space, maybe, you know, suddenly it just doesn't really make sense. You know, if you believe different things than I do, fine, right? The distance between, you know, the... the the, 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 the developed world where people have, you know, high-speed internet and the latest gadgets and so on and have fun and, the, and the, the makers and the geeks and the guys who can afford a 3D pin printer in their backyard and have a collection of Arduinos and step motors and do whatever with them. And the kids in Sutherland learning Scratch is not that big, you know. In Sutherland, what are they doing? They don't have much resources. They're always problem-solving. They're always making a plan. They're incredibly innovative minds. And so the distance isn't vast at all. And if there's something, you know, I'd like to, to leave with you today is that crowdsource astronomy, you know, we must think of the whole crowd. You know, we have the awesome technology, we have the phenomenal citizen science projects, you know, with the software and the hardware we're getting there. And then there's the rest of the world. And they can be brought on board. And we don't have to take, you know, a long time or be slow or, you know, have them go slowly through, you know, um, slow modems or whatever. We can just bring them on board and teach them the programming and the scratch and all that and see what they come up with. Because they have their thinking, their problems that they want to solve. And it's so much fun. And so this is it, really. This is the crowd is everybody on the planet. And astronomy has the power of inspiration, the power of perspective, and the power that it's actually a science, and it's a tinkerer's science. So if we can hack, bring people on board, and gain this perspective, I think we can go quite far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carolina Erdmann Govanda. Toll. Ja, muss man mitmachen. Ähm, Viertelstunde Pause und dann geht's hier weiter. Jetzt ist ganz guter Zeitpunkt, um was zu essen, aber bis gleich. Um, Moment, Moment, oh, bevor oh, ihr alle oh, geht, muss ich noch was ganz Kurzes ansagen. Ja, genau, Entschuldigung, habe ich nicht gesehen. Problem, Max, kein Thema. Also bitte sitzen bleiben, bitteschön. Es geht schön. ganz schnell. Ähm, wir wollten nur kurz noch mal Hallo sagen kommen, weil ihr habt ja gestern bestimmt alle die Geschichte mitbekommen und es gibt jetzt ein Happy Ending. I'm going to switch into English. So I'm sure yesterday you all heard in the welcoming ceremony and also when Max was introducing Sasha about the terrible situation that one of our speakers got in. So we've just heard about some great stories from Africa and now we can tell you the happy ending of like a... European Afro uh, Corporation. Um, and I'd like you all to just give a warm welcome to Andrea Nkoto Harianka Ratchutsamanana for making it to Republica. Hola Susaman. Um, thank you so much for bringing me here and uh, 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 respecting my, uh, um, uh, thank you. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm really um, uh, emotive about uh, this uh, situation, but I'm really happy to be here, and I want, I'm really thankful about uh, the support of the conference. And uh, I'm here to represent uh, our hub in Madagascar, and uh, I'm really thankful. I don't know. I don't have to worry. Thank but, you so uh, thank much. You thank so you for much. coming up and saying hi, and a special thank you. Special thank you to Marcos Learning from the Foreign Office from the Auswärtige Amt who helped make this possible. He'll be speaking here tomorrow at lunchtime on a panel on export control for dual-use software, so we can also thank him there then. Thanks very much, guys.